picked his shed up and had an encounter with him at age three and a half. And uh, if both sides would have matched, he'd have been roughly 115 inches. Mm -hmm. All right. At four and a half, and we know him quite well because of the photos that we got, at four and a half, he ended up at 164. So he literally blew 50 inches in one year, which is an anomaly here on this particular farm. But that's what he did. And we knew him quite well because of the photos. We picked up both sides, which is the reason we knew about what he would end up scoring. He went to 164 this year, okay, when he was four and a half. So at three and a half, he was 115. At four and a half, he was 164. And now at five and a half, he's 184. So he picked up another 20 inches. This segment of DOD TV is brought to you by Leopold, American to the core. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Drury Outdoors 100% Wild podcast. This is episode number 232. And this is a special edition. It is, because you're here. Uh, oh, wait. <laughs> and you're here. It's a self-esteem wait, booster edition. We're always here. <laughs> yeah, that's true, for no, better or worse. It's it's a special edition because old man winner, Terry Drury's with us, and he just killed the biggest whitetail of his life. It's insane. And the name, is, so the, the name of the buck is Little Gnarly. Yes. Or Lil Gnarly. Lil. If you're, if you're on the ghetto. Like Lil Taylor. Like <laughs> Lil Gnarly. <laughs> There's nothing little about this. No. Tear. So, so we'll get to Terry. In just a minute, we've got some housekeeping stuff to take care of. Oh, just good. in case people are wondering who the voice is. Oh, oh, you're Tim Chelsbeck. You're Matt Drury. And we're 100% and wild. Terry Drury happens to be my your father. Dad. Yeah. Old man winter. Nice job. Yeah. I'm 40. I'm a man. <laughs> you are 40. <laughs> All right, what, what's this housekeeping? Get, get to sweeping. Let's go. So we've got, uh, we want to say welcome to our newest 100% Wild Rack Pack members over on the Facebook group. That's right. We got Kelly Roeder, Michael Gordon, Joe Arias, Zach Snyder, Grace Jenkins. Grace Jen- I'm always shocked when we have women every time I say this. Women, 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 women. Why, why are they getting in here in this podcast? It's, I there's can ask nothing them. for them here. Maybe, maybe one of the membership questions will be, are you a woman? <laughs> If you are, allowed. why are you listening to this? <laughs> What's wrong with Joseph you? Joseph Audie, Kyle Gregg. Okay, that's it. Yeah, and then uh, Matthew Ford left us a five-star Apple podcast review. Hey, and thanks, he says, Matt. great stuff. Love the podcast. Great information, but breaking it up with some laughs. Keep up the good work. Well, that's by design, Matt. Every because laugh is scripted. That's right. In this show. We have a teleprompter. We read each joke. We <laughs> carefully write them out. We have a team of writers. <laughs> and we take multiple takes at it's it. It's Tim. <laughs> right. And it's kind of like in the moment. Yeah. We don't script any of this okay. stuff out. So uh, we also want to say a big congratulations to Jacob Broker, who's in the Rack Pack. He won the Lacrosse Arrowhead Boot Giveaway from the last episode. Pretty mm-hmm. awesome. We gave it a little exclusive to the Rack Packers. Membership has its benefits. Mm. Nice job, Jacob. That's what she said. Boog. Doesn't really fit, but it always does. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Without further ado, let's talk about the big boy. What's up, old man? How we doing? Good morning. Congratulations, first of all. That mm-hmm. is a giant. Thank you. Thank you. He was he was a, a homeboy, one that we knew, one that we've been after, a kind of chess match, and we knew going in that he quite possibly could be the biggest deer on the farm. So we targeted him and and we won the won the chess match. So it worked out pretty good. Just to to backtrack a little bit. So the largest deer you had killed up to this point was 178 inch Iowa whitetail back in 2004, right? 0304, somewhere in there. I have no idea what year it was. I just know it was a long, long time ago. <laughs> and you Brad Clement actually was filming back then. Yeah. So it was you, Brad Knight. you bought that farm that you're currently on about 0304, somewhere in there. Spring of 04. So to give you guys an idea and girls, an idea of, of how long this story kind of took to, to play out, Mm -hmm. you're 65 years old. You just had your 65th birthday back in September. You've owned that farm since 2004, 17 years, roughly. And this is the largest you've, you've had a larger deer, Mr. Christmas that has been on the farm before, but, but I think that's probably the only deer that's ever been bigger than this deer. Correct. To my knowledge. Yes. I think he ended up at 202. One of the neighbors ended up killing him at, uh, just right, right on the fence line there. And I, I think he was 202. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm kind of giving the backstory here because 
I think so often the viewers at home, you know, they, they may say, oh, these guys are doing it with regularity and it comes so easy and, and yeah. it, it doesn't always come so easy sure. for everybody. And it's, and you know, there's a lot of work and effort and even the success that Mark's had up there in Iowa, it, I think everybody kind of knows Iowa, those deer are different up there. And it's just, it's just a different, uh, almost a different breed, mm -hmm. but but still, Mark's working his absolute tail off to be successful year in and year out like right. that. Well, it's not for any different type of work ethic. It's just a different type of, I think, in Missouri and obviously a lot of other states, it's just a little bit different. And they can grow that big. Mm -hmm. But with regularity, I, I, not not so much, honestly. I mean, what do you think, Terry? Well, there, to start off with, there's over 20 some subspecies of whitetails throughout the United States. So there are they are different. You know, they're different breeds when you go down south in Florida versus something you might see on the border of Canada there. You know, totally different. And, and we see it between Illinois, Missouri and Iowa here in the Midwest. It's pretty apparent. Uh, so it's not uncommon to grow bigger deer when you have the right subspecies. And we talk about it all the time. You're only as good as your spot. So if you don't have them, you can't kill them. And if it don't have the genetics and, it, and because of that subspecies, you're not going to grow them no matter how old they get. And typically here on my farm, you know, top end is between 160 and 165. That's generally, that's about as big as they're going to get here. And mm -hmm. we've killed several in that, you know, bracket but we killed a lot of mature, mature deer. You know, we've been killing mature deer for 15 years, a lot of five and a half, six and a half, seven and a half. We killed one that was 10 and a half. One of yes. uh, Matthew Pate, when he came in and killed Curly, you know, and that deer was in the low fit or high fifties, low sixties. So sometimes they just don't reach that potential that you would like for them to do. Uh, little gnarly was an exception rather than the rule. I, I, I mean, he was an absolute gem much like your gnarly, Matt. And that's how we name this deer because of the similarities in the rack configuration. Matt killed a deer that absolutely blew between ages five and six. I mean, he really took a big, big jump. And we were like, man, if they could all do that, we'd be really, really happy. Mm -hmm. Well, little gnarly was the first one that's jumped like that deer. And that was, I'm trying to remember, that was 2018, I think, mm -hmm. when I killed that deer. So here we are, 2021, and <clears throat> it may be some offspring of them. I don't, I don't know, but it's, that's been a long time since then. And that deer gnarly had a ton of mass. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, he had, ma and that's, that's what you kind of notice out there on your farm is the, the difference, you know, is, is when they get to a certain age, they start picking up the really good mass, but it, this little gnarly and gnarly probably are probably the two that have picked up the most mass of all the deer you guys have killed there. I would say a lot of times you, they kind of seem like they stick with that spindly kind of frame and they just don't are, you know, they, and they got maybe small G ones, or there's always kind of a characteristic that your deer have there on that farm. And these two kind of were the exception to the rule. Yes. A uh, little Caesar would be a good example of that. He finally showed up the other day there. It's a deer that's, seven and a half, eight and a half years old. And he still is 115, 120 inches. Mm -hmm. And we've got a, a quite a history with him and, and we're going to target him, try and harvest him this year. I don't know if we'll get the job done because he's very exclusive, but it's, uh, it's, they're not too indifferent from people. You know, some are big and heavy and some are little bitty frames and big racks. And it's just, their their uh, their personalities are all different. This deer was what I would call semi lazy. We never saw him running. He was always by himself, somewhat of a loner. You know, all the pictures that we had of him over the course of his, his uh, you know, tenure with us was just, he was always kind of a loner and he never was, he never was very aggressive. He was a pretty boy. He kept his rack clean. It never was busted. Uh, so it was, it was kind of a neat, neat evolution to watch him reach his maximum potential. Matter of fact, we picked up his shed. Now this one's all chewed up, picked his shed up and had an encounter with him at age three and a half. And uh, if both sides would have matched, he'd have been roughly 115 inches. Mm -hmm. All right. At four and a half, and we know him quite well because of the photos that we got, at four and a half, he ended up at 164. So he literally blew 50 inches in one year, which is an anomaly here on this particular farm. But that's what he did. And we knew him quite well because of the photos. We picked up both sides, which is the reason we knew about what he would end up scoring. 
He went to 164 this year, okay, when he was four and a half. So at three and a half, he was 115. At four and a half, he was 164. And now at five and a half, he's 184. So he picked up another 20 inches uh, this year. But for them to blow that much on this farm is just, it's that's a, an anomaly. Much like Gnarly did, Matt. You have I gave you his sheds. Um, and he he blew quite a bit. He picked up, wasn't it like 40 inches? Yeah. He picked yeah. From, from uh, five and a half to six and a half. Yes. Yeah. Terry, what as, does the calculus ever enter into it? Like uh, in terms of the timing of the season, like a uh, little gnarly had probably not had a chance to pass on his genes this season yet. Does that play into your calculus when you think about kind of long-term management or is it like, this is a, this is a, a monster buck and anomaly for this area. I got to shoot him whenever I get the opportunity. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I would have done the same no, thing. Actually, that's a great question, Tim, because oddly enough, this deer, his tarsal glands were snow white. All right. And, you know, he's been on scrapes. We've watched, you know, we got pictures, a lot of uh, reconic cell cam photos of him. And he's on scrapes and, you know, in different spots on the farm. His home core area was not very big. His home core area has not been very big since he was born. Yeah. I mean, we've had him literally in the same area for quite some time. But Forrest and I both found it extremely odd that his torso glands were snow white here at October the 15th, 16th when I shot him. So I, I don't know, you know, is he an, a real aggressive, assertive deer? Was he a non-breeder? Uh, again, he was a loner. He, uh, you never saw him running. He was always walking real slow. Mm. I, I honestly don't know when they, when they hit those, those, uh, periods where the rack is perfect. And you see this quite often where you see the biggest deer on your farm with the biggest rack, mm -hmm. it might be a smaller body deer that just doesn't interact with all the other deer. Like those big Brutus, you know, eight points that score one thirty. they're all busted up their main beam, their G one, their G twos are broke. You know, it's, they're just a different personality. So that's a great question, uh, whether or not he had, you know, started the breeding cycle this year. I don't know, but because of the fact that we had so many pictures of him on scrapes, his tarsal glands should have been jet black. Yeah. And a lot of the other deer here on the farm, they're all jet black already. Matter of fact, we went in the other day and could smell one so strong. You know, you just know when you're close to a buck mm -hmm. uh, that you, because of the time of year where, where we're getting close to it, you know, the moon waxes full here on the 20th. And it is the hunter's moon. It's a little bit early this year. I like it when it's a little later, when it coincides with that <clears throat> later part in October there, like we had last year at Black mm -hmm. School on, on Halloween on the 31st. We had two full moons last year, one on the 1st, one on the 31st. We had cold weather and absolutely our team annihilated them yeah. through the month of October last year. We had a tremendous year, a little bit different this year. It's a little early. Uh, so I still say first hour, last hour, it's a little trickier hunting this year than it was last year. Plus, we don't have the temperatures. But getting back to your question, you, you know, I was I had targeted him early on, Tim. He was he was just, you know, a big, nice deer. And, and we played the chess match with him for years. I had we had an encounter with him at age three and a half on October the 15th. OK, okay. at three and a half at, on, at, on the 15th. Had at four and a half, we had an encounter with him on October the 5th and then another encounter on November the 16th. All right. Then at age five and a half this year, when we killed him, he daylighted for the very first time on October the 11th. OK. On the same field we shot him on or killed him on. And we weren't there. We uh, went to another spot. Mm. So we said, if he daylights again, we're going in there. And Deer Cast said, great. We missed the opportunity on the 5th or on the 11th. We said, we're not going to miss another one. And by golly, went in there and I'll be doggone if he didn't show his face. And he that's that that one on the 11th is the first daylight photo we got of him since last year. What time but, was the photo? Um, it was it was late evening. It was really late evening. So what you felt like he was possibly going to bed there or what? No, he just come out of his bed. Oh, I felt just came out of his bed mm -hmm. and uh it was a beautiful big photo you know his racks all shown and everything but he he uh came out we were watching where he came out watching where he was going in, into bed in the mornings and then watching where he was coming out in the evenings and uh he didn't come out where we thought he might but <coughs> excuse me we had two other little small bucks a two and a half and a three and a half came out behind bud's north box matt you know that box yep. quite well and 
they both came out downwind of where we were sitting. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we said, you know what? We probably ought to watch our backside here. It's a little uncanny. And this could be karma. The fact that they both came out downwind and I'm talking 35, 40 yards. I mean, this was close mm -hmm. to where we were sitting and I'd be doggone if that's where he didn't pop out. A little spike squirted out and then one long, he came right behind him downwind. <sighs> Now, in the blind, you know, it, it, people can watch the hunt in deer cast. They can watch the hit. I mean, it's 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 pretty incredible. It sounded like you said something like oh, the hit was a little farther back. I mean, it looked like a pretty good pretty good hit to me. Obviously, it worked. But how did you feel about the shot? And like, what was your thinking in the moment as he's standing there? Because it looked like he was a little kind of quartering away a little bit. Well, in the blind, Forrest and I are about three foot apart. So his angle, and we, we get this all the time where, where people may watch the, the video and go, wow, that's either too far forward or too far back. Not in this case. He was quartering pretty severe for me. So I intentionally shot it back. I, mi I missed him about an inch from where I was aiming. I was mm -hmm. actually left of where I was actually aiming, but I was trying to shoot him back. I was okay. aiming for the off shoulder, Sure, you know, because you want to go right up through the boiler room and there is no better shot than either broad or quartering away. And I like that quartering away shot. So I had a pretty big opening there. So, you know, chose to tuck it back intentionally, but I went about an inch further than what I was actually aiming. If you look at the pictures on DeerCast, it actually, the exit is pretty much perfect. Yeah. So yeah, the angle was good. And, and we should probably mention, because we take this for granted a lot, you guys have a saying where you, where you say aim to exit. And I think like if you're a newer bow hunter, especially, you may not, you may not know what that means or you may not have heard that before, but essentially Terry, like it, it means like you're, you're kind of figuring like in three dimensions where that arrow is going to come through on the, on the offside and what you're going to hit in the process. I always aim for the off shoulder. I aim for the offside, particularly when they're quartering away. Now broad is a little different. Obviously you're going to punch both lungs and go square through it. But when I, I prefer letting them get just slightly quartering away. I really do. When that leg goes forward or he wrinkles, a lot of times they'll open up and wrinkle for you. I would say into your hand or away from your hand, much like a bull rider talks on a bull. Well, when they open up like that, boy, it's, you got, you know, you got the whole boiler room right in front of you there. And I, I always look at the off shoulder. You, I think that's, that's a, easy mistake to make in the, in the heat of the moment. Cause you're looking, you're so focused as a hunter on that, on the, on shoulder, obviously, or yep. what angle he's at. You might think you had a per perfect angle, but if that front shoulder is back a little bit and the, and the back shoulder is forward pretty far, it actually changes your shot quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, where the vitals, how, how they're, how they are inside the deer, where right. they're at inside yeah. the deer. Yep. And you got to really, that's something you really have to pay attention to, but it can be hard in the moment. Well, he kind of stretched out a little bit too, didn't he, Terry, there towards the end? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What, what I failed to tell you and what hasn't been shown on DeerCast uh -oh. because we, we edited it pretty quickly was the first shot. <laughs> and I, even, even shooting poorly. I can't miss one by this much. <laughs> and I don't know what happened. I'm still, we went back and watched it over and over and over, watched all the GoPro angles and all that stuff, trying to figure out. I don't know if I accidentally deployed the blade in the blind because mm -hmm. it was pitch black in there. I was struggling trying to knock my arrow. I did. I thought, well, maybe I knocked it above or below the D loop. Mm. And then I thought, well, maybe it was on the wrong side of the rest because I could hear it clanging around in there as we were trying to kind oh. of do our little fire drill, you know? Yeah. And uh, I, I somewhat think I opened or deployed the head. It's not shown in the video. You don't see it, but it missed him by two foot, like a foot and a half or two foot. And you don't see that on the deer cast version, but you will in 13. We'll show that. Uh, and deer season 21, you'll probably show it too. I would assume, which might be out here by the end of the week. Yeah. More than likely. I mean, but he, he, like he was down feeding and it literally went a foot and a half or two foot up and over. And I was like, what in the world happened there? So testimony to shooting with your quiver on, I pulled another arrow out and knocked it. And uh, because the window's open now and I can see what in the heck I was doing. So I knocked it correctly and then settled into the exact same spot I had aimed the previous shot yeah. and it drilled him. So you just, I can't even miss by that much at 20 yards. 19 I yards. mean, that's the definition of fair chase though, right? I mean, you gave him a warning shot before you finally killed him. And he took it like a man. So he, <laughs> so he just, he had no idea. 
And here's another another point besides having a, your quiver on your bow, I, which I shoot with it on all the time. Mm-hmm. I've never, ever shot without being on my bow. It's testimony to not over hunting a spot. Like the last time we hunted that particular blind was Olivia uh, last year. So they, they feel pretty comfortable in some of these areas that we have not hunted. And we choose, pick and choose our spots to go in there and optimize the, uh, the hunts, which is what we did, meaning he didn't know what happened. If we had been over hunting that blind, number one, he wouldn't have been that close. Mm-hmm. And number two, he more than likely would have scooted out of there pretty quick. But he literally had no idea what had happened. He was down feeding and it went past him. He looked up and he became kind of attentive and a little more alert. And all he did was opened up for us. It just made it that much easier, honestly. Cue all the comments that you can't do that in PA. You can't do that in Michigan. (laughs) (laughs) Public land. But but, I mean, the reality is a lot of people probably can't uh, not overhunt a spot because you might only have a couple spots. (laughs) And so I get that too, but it's pretty, pretty awesome that, that you got the second chance at him, but it's one thing to get a second chance. It's another thing to have the composure to make the shot because it could get, you could get real flustered. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. a giant deer, so it's real easy to get real flustered, but I'd like to think that might be where the experience comes into play, you know, and you've pretty much seen it all at this point here, hunting life, you know, hunting white tails for over a half a century, 53, 54 years. God. So yeah, you know, you've, you've seen it all, but that doesn't make you, <laughs> that don't make you do it right in the heat of the moment. So it does, there is a certain amount of composure that, that you have to readjust and, and regroup and so on. But I was so pissed to be quite honest, like what on God's green earth could possibly have happened there. You can't miss one by that much. You just can't. And I, I was, I was perplexed as to what happened. And I thought to myself, I thought, well, I've either, because it's pitch black in there, I either had it on the wrong side of the, of the rest or I knocked it wrong or blade deployed because when I was trying to open the window, I had, it was pitch black. So I knocked the arrow and then, then opened the window. When we got the right opportunity, he looked, he looked straight South. And when he turned his head, I pulled the window down and opened it and I could have very easily hit the curtain, hit the seat, hit my Mm -hmm. pack. I, I don't know. So we went back and listened to even listen to the audio. The first arrow doesn't sound anything like the second one. So I don't know what went on. I still don't know. And I'm still pissed about it because you don't get a, you know, it's a, it's a target arrows or target deer standing there in front of you at 19 yards. You don't get those opportunities watering away. And, and we have uh, 15 minutes of pre-roll. I mean, we were patient and waiting. And I even told Forrest, I said, I prayed to God that it, I said, you know, don't let me screw this up. Well, I'll, de- I'll be damned if I didn't screw it up anyway. <laughs> Which God did you pray to? <laughs> Not the right one. <laughs> I don't know. The first one, I didn't do a very good job. Second one. You know, I, I wonder, because on Gnarly, you know, I... I had what said, what is it with you guys? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had not, I had, the bow was on the ground. I pulled it up. We we're getting out. I pulled it up, but I went to knock an arrow and I didn't knock it all the way. I didn't push it back on the string all the way. I just wonder if you that's that, what happened to you. That would have been the case. Could have been. Mm-hmm. And you know why I don't tuck it in there real, real tight? Because a lot of times you're, you're, uh, you know, your knock will, will light up. Yeah. So I'm, careful about trying not to do that you know yeah that, so, that could have been the case matt I, I i we went back and watched it over and over and over and i can't figure it out i'm still still ticked about it it's and, just it's so frustrating for something like that to happen when you get that opportunity because you only get so many you're lucky to get one or two I, a year and we hunt a lot of days throughout the season tim you know how it is you you just you're if you don't capitalize it's a very very short window you either slam them shut or you jump through them and, um, uh, you know, when you botch it up, you're so mad at yourself. It's, it's beyond belief. I'm still, you know? I'm still taking myself for my, <laughs> for my botch up. Does this hit home? Tim? <laughs> it really does. Tim had a mess up here oh, maybe 10 days ago. Yeah, or so. my, my target buck was, was coming in at like 35 yards. I was moving all the, you know, the camera arm around and stuff. And I bumped my true fire handheld release on my string. And I just happened to bump it with my elbow in the right way that it fired it fired the 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 actuator and it fell off my bow onto the metal platform of my muddy stand oh, and clunk and it but th- that still didn't stop him but it, it did give him pause and it put him on edge and uh so yeah so there you are still <laughs> still thinking about that one <laughs> those instances those are the ones you remember and you go damn you know if if i wouldn't have screwed that up 
and it's usually user error. You know, mm-hmm. we're, the, we're the ones that normally botch it up. It's not the deer. It's usually the hunter. And uh, you just hate yourself for a brief period. You may hate yourself for a long time. I don't know. Depends how the season goes. Still, yeah, right. This yeah. could be the death knell. Because I was, I was honestly, this is, I'm not lying. I was sitting in the uh, blind last night. We were hunting and I was. Is this a lie? This is not a lie. I was literally having this exact thought. Like we've had, so Kansas was great, mm-hmm. but in Missouri, we've not had one encounter with one decent buck. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's been really rough so far this year. And, uh, I, I was even sitting there thinking to myself, cause we we're on a pretty good deer, but he's real sporadic. He doesn't live on, on us. I don't think, you know, based on when I get the pictures and where they're at and sure. on the property. And I kept thinking to myself, we're going into this cause we're pretty much going into the rut now here soon, you know, to be here before you know it. And we haven't had one good encounter. We haven't been kind of put under the fire drill, so to speak of, yeah, cause it it's, it's, yeah, there's a different feeling, even if it's say it's not a shooter, but it's a mature buck or whatever that you're, you know, it's a different feeling. And I keep thinking to myself, like we are very unprepared for the moment of truth right now. And I don't want that moment of truth. The first moment of truth to be mm-hmm. the moment of truth with that deer in a tree stand in the morning. You, you know what I mean? But it and, could be. And it very well could be the way our season's shaping up. And I just hate that because Terry, as you know, you, you guys, you kind of have the luxury of you go and you shoot a lot of does in the early season. You kind of work through all those kinks and it's, it's just different when you're ready to shoot something. It's just different. And you're right. You only get one or maybe two chances. If you screw it up, your season screwed up. <laughs> I yep. mean, and so I, I'm, I'm worried about that, but thankfully it worked out for you guys. You got the second chance. You capitalize perfect shot. How far did the deer run? Mm, maybe 70, 80 yards downhill. Yeah. I mean, the blood was just pouring out of him when he ran off. So we knew it was, you know, we knew it, he was dead, honestly. We, you know, you always pray and you ne- you're never a hundred percent till you mm-hmm. put your hands around him, but we were fairly certain that, I mean, it just, it went up through the boiler room there with a two, three, they, they're not going to go Are far. You shoot you know, the rage two, three chisel or just the two, three chisel. Yeah. Two, three chisel. Yeah. I'm a huge believer in that head. We've, we've harvested a lot of deer with it and some, you know, if we do have to tuck tight or you make an Aaron shot it'll clip the edge of that shoulder, boom, it goes right through. It's, it's as good a broad head has ever been manufactured, in my opinion. Huge. <laughs> hey, I want to I make a point here. You know, we were talking about personalities and different type of deer a while ago. You know, we chose, and we get we got beat up a little bit about this, we chose not to take a decoy in. I've been using a decoy here for maybe 10 days to two weeks already because of the activity that we were seeing. We were seeing deer with busted up tines already, missing G1s, broken main beams seeing them hitting the scrapes pretty hard. A lot of that, even though the temperatures are warm, you know, so much of this is happening at night. And that's what happens to the rut, that so much of it is not exposed during daylight hours. It all happens at night. So we went to a spot here the other day, chose to take the decoy, had had three or four different bucks come in, one in particular, a, a big nine point, five and a half year old nine, it came in all bristled up, you know, and, and we said, you know what, this thing's working. We got beat up a little bit over it, but uh, you can't overlook the personalities of each individual deer. I chose not to use that decoy on this deer because the history we've had with him, he seemed to be a loner. He seemed to be a pretty boy. He didn't seem to be very aggressive or very assertive. He was always walking real slow. Typically, he was by himself, and it would be odd hours of the night when there were no other deer around. So I chose intentionally not to use a decoy on this particular deer. So part of that is because of the time of the year that the moon is waxing full here. Again, October the 20th is way early for for the hunter's moon to be waxing early, but that that doesn't mean they're not ready to go. And that's what we were seeing. The does are not yet, but the bucks were. And the fighting is all happening. The sparring and all that stuff is happening at night, which if you guys have checked your cameras much at all, you'll see a bunch of sparring going on at night and the temperatures have suppressed the daylight exposure, but it's still happening during those nocturnal hours, you know? So uh, I want to make sure that everybody's aware of that. But again, understanding the deer that you're hunting helps a lot. And you understand body posture and you understand where he's going and why he's going there. This deer never left a circle of maybe 30 or 40 acres as he got older there. It was a pretty, pretty small circle that he stayed in. His home core was really, really tight. All those encounters that we had, 
all of them are on the same field from three and a half, four and a half, and five and a half, same field. Wow. So he just didn't go very far. But again, I chose not to take a decoy to, to try and harvest him. Hmm. I tried a decoy yesterday. <laughs> We didn't see any deer. It didn't work out so high. (laughs) It wasn't because uh, it did or didn't work. It's because we didn't see any deer. (laughs) There's no deer around to even notice them. Nope. (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting, Terry. You mentioned just the individual personalities of deer. And and I mean, it really does seem like they vary. Like I I, I had a doe a few nights ago where I was trying to get out of my stand and I'm trying to clear the field. And there was just one doe out there at 100 yards. So I started doing my terrible coyote howl. And she came running to me. She came running to 20 yards to see i mean that a super cure that was a super curious doe but most will most will run but they just they, they do have they seem to have individual personalities you know that's a great point tim because it's about it's actually it's harder to get out of a stand than it is to get in a stand i i wish there was a product on the market where you could clear a field but yet it wouldn't disturb them to your position. I really do. I mean, I don't care if it would be jingle bells or something that you could mm. toss out there, but that is really tough. I all hoot at them and they'll stand there for 30 minutes. I just continue hooting and they're to the point they're almost immune to it now. Uh, but <laughs> there's getting awesome. down. Annoying. <laughs> <laughs> that, literally, it's, it's tough to get out because you certainly don't want to tip them off to your position. Yeah. That's the last thing you want to do because the moment she comes out the next time, she's going to be looking right in your tree or right in your blind or whatever, ground blind. You know, it's it's hard. I, I hate trying to leave a blind. Absolutely hate it because you want to go back there the next time when it's undisturbed. That's not the case. Every time you go in, the sightings start to diminish. Uh, getting back to your point about, and we talked about this a while ago, about knocking the cobwebs off, we call it a dress rehearsal. Shooting does early season. I filmed Forrest last night. He killed his first deer of the year last night. Drilled her. 12 ring, you know, just drilled her. And she ran, I don't know, 70, 80 yards, fell over. But it's always nice to knock the cobwebs off. And and we we process them and, and go ahead and eat them here in camp. So it's not like it wasn't because we didn't want to. We want sure. to. We want to harvest some does or as many as we can and uh, enjoy doing it. But it's sure nice to go through that dress rehearsal or knock the cobwebs off, if you will and harvesting the first doe that comes into bow range and going through the right motions and knowing when to draw, letting her get broadside, letting her get quartering away, making sure you anchor correctly. And then, you know, making sure you bend it at the waist, all those things that you want to do repetitiously and by nature, uh, it's not no different than a guy swinging a bat or a golf club or shooting a basketball. You know, you want muscle memory to be correct in the heat of the moment because your mind sometimes doesn't work real well. Mm. So you want to make sure that your muscles do. And the only way to do that is continue practicing every day, a, a regimen or a ritual every single day, even if it's only half a dozen shots or eight to 10 shots, just make sure you go through the exact same regimen every single day. And then in the heat of the moment, your muscles take over. Yeah, that's right. Well, let's, uh, let's help our buddy Josh out. He's got this week's question <coughs> of the day. The question of the day is probably brought to you by Cold Steel, pioneering new materials and designs to shape the modern world of knives, edged weapons, and tools. Bingo. Good job. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. <laughs> and again, and again, Hi, we used, we used a cold steel knife last night to field dress for us dough. You go, Terry. Sweet. There we go. Hi, Matt and Tim. Love the podcast. Well, thanks. Up I know. Great work. I am a big user of the Scent Crusher line of products. Um, my question is, is there such a thing as over ozoning your equipment and clothing. I'm curious as to what you two have to say about it. Thanks. Well, as much as you want to hear our thoughts, we'll start with Terry and uh, go from there. What do you think, old man? You know, I honestly, that's a good question because I don't know. To be perfectly honest, I don't know if you can over ozone. I don't think so. I doubt very seriously. Uh, but we we use it every day. Use the scent crusher closet. Use all their products. I, I love the sit crusher line, you know, completely it, it really overall because they cover all your bases. You know, there's so many different things you can use it for, whether it's the, the tote, the cargo carrier, the bag, the portable bag, the closet, you know, we got the scent crusher closets in the bunkhouse in the trailer and the war room. We got them all over the place. You just shove your stuff in there. You leave it, you plug it on for 30 minutes or something. You head to the blind. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of scent crusher, huge fan, but whether or not you can over ozone, I have no clue. I think, 
you know, I know Mark and those guys up there, they usually do like a 10 minute cycle on their stuff. I personally like going longer by, you know, and it probably has a little bit to do with, you know, the last time you washed your gear or what happened if say it was a hot day yesterday, we ended up, you know, sweating a little bit more than normal. So I'll put it on for a little more time, you know, yeah. it might be 30 minutes or, or whatever. Just so the Mexican restaurant, <laughs> 60 minutes, a little more. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I think it kind of depends on what, what's happening and what, what you did to your clothes, you know, what, what kind of scent is on them as far as how often I'm or how much I'm going to ozone them. Yeah. Yeah. That's my personal kind of regimen. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 uh, I, I, I really don't know. Like I try to, I try to be cautious with my boots cause I don't want to degrade any organic rubber compounds that are in there. But my clothes, like I, I, I usually, if I have time, I try to go with 30, even 60 minute cycles. Like if I'm getting ready to go, or if I know I'm going to go in the afternoon, I'll hit it with a, with an hour long cycle. It's so. basically like what, washing your clothes. Yeah. And the, and the nice thing is it doesn't wear out your clothes. Like, 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 a, like a traditional washing the fabric does. And, yeah. You don't fade the camo and it just, it tends to keep your clothes newer longer, which honestly anymore, I don't know that unless it's a cotton material camo, like most of the stuff is some sort of synthetic. It doesn't seem to wear out from washing it either. Seems like, like, like the printing process has gotten better and the dyes have gotten better. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but I, I don't know. So I try to hit it when we get back done with a hunt on my way home. Yeah. And then I try to hit it, you know, at least 20 minutes on the way back to the spot the next day or whenever the next hunt might be. So yeah. it kind of regenerates it or whatever. Yeah. I mean the, the good, I, I think that for Josh, the takeaway is I don't know that there's I don't know that there is such a thing as over ozoning. I do know this though. You can over ozone like any, um, um, elastic bands are, you know, like say you got, uh, elastic uh, Natural rubber doesn't stand up so well. Yeah. Like you're gonna, you're gonna bake in those things, you know, make it look like curled up bacon. If you do use it too mm -hmm. often, those are the only items that you probably can overdo it. Yep. And I try to not put that stuff in as much, but generally speaking, the majority of the hunting gear that we wear doesn't affect it at all. Right. So, yeah. The, the cool part is, uh, scent crusher makes it so easy for someone to do that e either at home or in the field. I, I love their line. I really do. Those guys have knocked it out of the park in my opinion. For sure. And even shoot like room, the room clean we have here at the office in the bathrooms, the, you know, the you survive on it. Yeah. The, uh, the generator that you put in those on go that goes into yeah. your truck, you know, the cigarette lighter, uh -huh. you know, those, I mean, every, all, there too, every hunt we go on, I, plug it in on the way in and that way whatever i'm you know kind of it's almost like i don't know how long you're supposed to put it in for i know they have cycles that it goes through mm -hmm. so it doesn't harm you yeah. you know but you know a couple cycles of those and it feels like you're almost like clean your hair or any you know your beard or whatever that might have picked up scent from the day mm -hmm. before you go hunting it's almost like a, a way to help there too so i know we don't want to go totally deep diving on this topic, but this year I've recognized two blind spots I've had in my scent management process. And I've started taking off my watch and I've got a, like a road ID and, you know, because I, I run and I bike a lot, these things gather a lot of sweat and a lot of odor I'm assuming. And so I've been leaving these at the truck and then I've been, I've been using, um, uh, uh, scent free detergent and ozoning my bath towel that I use prior to yeah. my hunt. Cause I, I, early in the season, I, I went to dry off after a shower and I was like, it smells, I'm just wiping myself down with scented laundry detergent. This isn't, it's like undoing everything I'm doing here in the shower. For sure. You know, back in the day, that was one of the things that, <laughs> you know, when we first started with scent blocker back, you know, late or early two thousands, that was one thing that Scott Schultz there always talked about, you know, and having, making sure that you're, you, you know, Hey, if you use scent free soap, well, you're kind of undoing everything you did by using a scented towel, which yeah. I know a lot of guys from that era of, of hunting girl kind of going up and hunting, then use those regiments today. But now I don't know that a lot of people still do that stuff or go through that kind of exhaustive efforts on, on a, a large scale. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was just like an eye opener for me. Like, why didn't I think of this before? I, I wash all my pillowcases, bed clothes, towels. I put it all in the scent free detergent, every bit of it. Turban. Because the last <laughs> thing you want to do is throw a bounce 
pod in there, yeah. you know, because it's got such a fragrance. Same way with the dryer sheets. I use the, the scent-free dryer sheets that we have from HS, use them all the time, you know, and all the nose jammer products, all the liquid laundry detergent, use all that stuff for all my bed clothes and towels. Yep. So, uh, Tim just brought up the turban, your turban. So have you seen the finished edit on your commercial, your awesome commercial? You know, somebody who sent me that the other day, somebody sent it to me. It was pretty good. I got to admit, it was really intellectual. <laughs> your acting, your <laughs> acting <laughs> was through the roof. <laughs> we we you should. So, Willa said, I can't believe you did that. And I think you were kind of flabbergasted too, that I agreed to that. But, you know, my, my answer to that was, the guys at the studio do so much for us, Tim, you, you're included in this. I do the most what they probably have done for us over the years has been off the charts, honestly. So rarely do they ask. And, and yeah, was it kind of corny? Absolutely. It was the corniest thing I've ever done. It's actually uh, pretty funny. That's not true because you did a traditions commercial where you were in a onesie that had an American flag on it. So right. you yeah. take that back. <laughs> Dude. Did they use that? Well, yeah. <laughs> Corny too, but rarely do I agree to stuff like that. <laughs> but honestly, all those guys in the studio have been so good and done so much work. And, you know, they, they rarely get the thanks that they should. So when they ask, which they rarely do, mm -hmm. I, I went along with it and said, heck yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. Well, you're saying the wrong thing because they just told me that they got some other ideas for you. <laughs> so. Okay. I, I did say one and done now. <laughs> <laughs> you set a precedent. I told them, I said, I don't think you're going to get them back in here yet this year. <laughs> It's so. Mark's turn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let's hop on over to the wildlife word. It is brought to you by Hunter Specialties, makers of the brand new DOD line of deer calls, including the buck bark, the dominant doe, and Matt's favorite, the rack jack. Ooh yeah. Yeah. Hey, yep. say what you want about it. The thing does sound really good. It does. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I've got rack jack in my pack. I yeah. just put mine in yesterday, actually. I used it the other day. I, I was real, real cautious about it. And I was talking about using a decoy already this year. I didn't overuse it. I could see, you know, a little 10 or 12 year old kid just going ballistic with it, with it making a lot of rattling sounds. But I think it, it's just like everything else. You have to use it sparingly and use it wisely. So when you use it, you just got to be real, real cautious about not overusing. It. I actually mentioned that to Tim uh, just maybe yesterday or the other day that I thought, here, you know, Thursday and Friday, the full moons, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning, the weather looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. I said, maybe you will have another shot at the deer that he calls a safe buck, the one where the release dropped. I said, you might bring in that rack jack and just a, a little bit of a slight sound to kind tap of peek, a tap, a tap, 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 tap it in, <laughs> you know, to peak curiosity and, uh -huh. and try to get him to come over to your side of the fence there. He's close. So, yeah. But it's that time of year. Mm -hmm. We can start doing these. The, the one short window we get where we actually get to use calls and, you yeah. know, rattle. You can and influence it. them. Yeah. Yeah. It's a helpless um, feeling otherwise. Well, real quick. When, when do you think, you know, th I know that they still go through those times of year, the same time every year, but with the moon, the way it is like a lot of, and the kind of heat that we have temperature wise, it might happen at night. When do you start your calling sequence or picking up on that? Is it the last week of October going into November or is it more like Halloween or when do you start kind of using those tips and tactics? Typically, I'll get a little bit more aggressive that first 10 days of November. Okay. That's when things start to pick up just a little bit. And a lot of times, I just want them to know where these two bucks are fighting. And again, I won't overcall. I never have called a lot. But once again, we were talking about body posture and recognizing the personality of a deer. Oftentimes, you can see that and you can see it in the scrapes. If, you, if you've been studying many pictures, the ones that are the most assertive oftentimes will be the first ones to come in and check out your, your position. Uh, but you got to make sure that you got a downwind side because they're always going to go downwind. I mean, you just got to be prepared for that. So make sure you have a shooting lane behind you. If you decide to rattle or grunt or something, you know, uh, if it's a really, really aggressive mature deer and he owns that spot, then a lot of times he'll come straight to your tree and he's going to turn broadside. Don't shoot him quartering two. give him an opportunity to get broad for you or quartering away because they're going to wrinkle one way or the other. But subordinates will always go downwind. They're always on your downwind side. So if you're, if you're just out there to shoot a deer, you know, and you want to go back home and you're limited to the number of hours or weekend days that you have, 
will make sure that you've got a shooting lane on your downwind side, but particularly if you're going to be rattling and grunting and all those things. But I like that first week in November to start. And then as the season progresses, I think we're going to see a real slow period here yet. I think once the moon waxes full, it's going to be good for a while. Mornings are going to get really good here. Uh, 17, 18, 19, or after, after the full on the 20th, 21, 22, 23, you know, we got some cool temps like you addressed there. It's going to get really good where that moon is hanging high in the sky till 830, then 930 and so on and so forth. And then it almost goes back the other way. Then you're going to see some weird midday movement at two and you're going to go, why are they on their feet? Uh, so it's a little odd, but we've got two or three days. Those windows are really, really sharp. But I would be looking at mornings here, 21, 2, 3, 4, somewhere in that ballpark, uh, particularly with the cooler temperatures they're calling for. The cool. rut could really suck this year. Yeah. I think it will. Yeah. If, yeah. if, if we can get a cool front or two, it, it might, it'll help us. But man, it's, that looks not overly great for the long term forecast. Yeah. It's yeah. 74 degrees here, you know, and I know. There's a lot of guys that in Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, they deal with warm temperatures year round. So they're accustomed to dealing with that stuff. I don't know how they do it. I really don't. Like I got a pair of shorts on here this morning. It's just, I can't, I can't deal with it. Like even in the blinds when we're sweating our butts off, you know, it's, it's tough. We, we've been trying to pick shady spots. Typically we're, we're looking for shady spots with the right wind because we're just not, our radiators were built for 20 below, not, 70 above, yeah. you know? Well, speaking of temperatures, that's what this uh, wildlife word is all about. What a transition. Check it out. So 34 degrees to 37 degrees is the temperature window for aging venison. And that's because, A, it's the standard coldness of most refrigerators. B, <laughs> it's below the threshold for bacterial growth but it won't freeze the meat. C, this is a lie, or D, all of the above. You threw this together quickly, didn't you? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of thought here. <laughs> okay. And help. Go, go ahead, Terry. Me. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding. Yeah, that's is. right. That's right. Yep, it's it's that sweet spot. So it, the meat won't rot, and it'll the enzymes inside will naturally break down the connective tissue, but it also won't freeze because you don't want your meat to freeze and then thaw and then freeze again. It doesn't, it like actually breaks the cell, like the muscle tissue cells and makes for a, a poorer table fare. That's what she said. <laughs> She's always talking about table fare. <laughs> get so sick of her saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what's next for you guys? Try to get forced uh, on a deer there, I assume in Missouri, then kind of bop over to Illinois. Yes, exactly. I think, uh, you know, it's going to get tough here before too long. We've got this window that we were talking about, so we're going to try and get him on a deer. We've got several mature deer, decent racks, you know, that, that we're targeting. And uh, we just need the weather to cooperate. Mother Nature has been pretty rough, so we need some cool temps. We're going to be sitting those mornings after the moon waxes on the 20th. We'll go hunt three, four, five mornings and uh, try not to disturb too much, but we're going to try and get him on a deer. Yes, then we will bop over to Illinois and start that process. We we really don't have the deer over there that we were hoping for. It's been pretty rough. The army worms went through and annihilated these giant alfalfa fields that we had over there. Uh, you know, acres and acres and acres of alfalfa, and they just whistled through it. And it, it looks like a, a beach of Normandy right now. It's just brown. So I don't know. Our deer disappeared. I wonder what happens to the army worm once it goes through a field like that. Like, where does it go? What's it going to, how's it survive after that? Cause they do, they go through and they clear it out. Then where do they go? I don't know. In a turkey's belly, a lot of turkeys, we've been seeing turkeys out the wazoo over there now. They're just pecking around, picking them up. Turkeys will be 30 pounds this year. if We harvest one. I mean, at some point they got to turn into a pupa and then a, some kind of moth or something. So they, I mean, they, they fly away at some point, probably they turn into a what pupa pupa <laughs> Matt. <laughs> it's a biological term. Okay. Grow up. Isn't That's that how they're, 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 Tim? Yes. Sir. Isn't that, aren't they laid by the eggs or, or laid there by moths to begin with? Are they not? Isn't that how they, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know what army, I don't know what army worms actually are. Like if they're a moth or they're a beetle, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't Matt's, know something. Matt's head's about to fall off. <laughs> <laughs> but the, but they turn into something. They're the larva of something. So I don't know whether I think they... it's a moth. I do believe it's a moth. Yeah, it could be. So they, they lay those eggs, they hatch, and then they turn into this beautiful green worm that eats everything. 
Beautiful. But y'all don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> we got in a fight about worms. <laughs> Well, if folks have not seen this hunt, definitely go to DeerCast and check it out. It's up there right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm assuming it'll be pinned at the top for a few days there until the Deer Season 21 episode comes in. And uh, and that might be as soon as the end of this week. So hopefully that'll that'll get up. It's, uh, I'm trying to think. Ben just got there at your place, the guy that's editing it. So it'll be probably Friday at the earliest, I would think, maybe even Saturday. So... Perhaps. Yeah. We've, we've laid it out pretty, pretty good for him. Forrest went through and found all, you know, at age three and a half, the encounters we had at four and a half, the encounters, the, uh, you know, the reconics picks and all that. It's, it's pretty well laid out. So hopefully he'll be able to crank, crank it or bang it out right away and, and get it up there as soon as possible for people to watch. Very cool. Great. I hope everybody's enjoying Deer Season 21. Mark's episode with his uh, 216 is up, of course. And, you know, we've had T- Taylor's Elk and, you know, a bunch of other cool episodes from the early season. I think they're up to 15 or 16 episodes so far. So mm-hmm. cruising along and a lot of great content there inside DeerCast are uh, over on the Drew Outdoors YouTube channel. Yeah. Lots of you know to what, watch Matt? I I over or failed to mention the fact that he uh, he daylighted that date on October the 11th was a great. Your cast predicted a great, and we didn't go there because we had we had zero daylight pictures of him. And I'll be doggone if that didn't you know push him to walking during daylight hours. And then we regretted not going there. We even talked about it. Said, man, he's been all around this. You know, everything's been nocturnal. Why waste our time? Well, Deer Cast gave us a great. And we didn't capitalize, didn't go in there. So we said, if it happens again, we're going to go there. And we did. It was another great that evening that we that we harvested the deer. So I can't say enough good things about deer cast. I know we get beat up over that from time to time, but there are a lot of other apps out there. There's nothing like this one because of the secret sauce. I said it's like a Kentucky Fried Chicken recipe. Uh, it'll be a hard one to figure out. But there's a lot of things, a lot of influencers that go in there that are weighted differently as the season progresses. And you know uh, full well how the phases are weighted. Each individual phase is weighted. Each individual influencer is separately weighted within the algorithm as the season progresses. So it's not just about the moon. It's not just about the barometer. It's not just about the temperatures. There's uh, 13 influencers that go in there and and we feel like the algorithm is tweaked pretty doggone well right now. And just because another app might use terminology that we use doesn't mean they actually know what they're talking about. That's right. So. Are, the color, just, are the color of the screen? Yeah. I'm just going to leave it at that. We're flattered. <laughs> Deeply flattered. There you go. All right. Deer cats. Not a finger deer. looking good. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks All right, for- guys. Thanks for stopping by, Terry. We appreciate it. Thanks for everyone who's watching. Thanks for everyone who's joining the 100% Wild Podcast Rack Pack over on Facebook. And congratulations. More importantly, biggest Mm -hmm. deer of your life, biggest deer in the farm. Couldn't be more happy for you. You you know what? I I will say this, Matt, and I like to kill big deer just like everybody else. You know, everybody gets wrapped up in inches and size and all that stuff, which I think is phenomenal. But it was more about the chess match. And more about knowing him and trying to beat them at that game because when it happens, it's so rare. Mark's the only one that does it with regularity. Uh, but when it happens, it's so rare that it's it, you, it makes you feel good about the accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a long chess match. And if you're patient enough to let it go two, three, four years in a row where you're after that same deer, by golly, when you finally close the deal, it's, it's a, a good feeling. Well said. We like wait. to have a good feeling. I mean, <laughs> that's what our show is all about. Feeling great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. $200 is $200. I mean, can't argue. <laughs> Terry, thanks again. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. All man. right. Good, uh, good luck. Be safe. Wear those harnesses. Absolutely. Safe harness. All right. Until next time. Peace out. Temperatures are going to be dropping. Perfect conditions for the skinny field. Gotta focus on those afternoon hunts. Northwest Tree Stand, 5 p.m. It's the easiest decision you'll make this season. Get ahead of your game with DeerCast. <sighs> Biggest buck of his life. Pretty awesome. That's and pretty cool. As someone that's been around for 40 years of his 65, he has worked very hard at this, and he's always been kind of the tough luck Drury. Yeah. You know, whether it's a misplaced shot or, you know, a, a missed opportunity or whatever the case may be. So I couldn't be more thrilled to see it all come together for him. I said, I said on the phone to him, I, you know, when he 
I talked to him after he killed it. I said, you almost pulled a Terry, <laughs> but you got, you, you totally redeemed yourself. <laughs> it, it, yeah. It, it ended up working out for him. I wonder like, what do you think that's doing? That kill has done for his mood over the past few days. Mood. Great. Uh, as you know, I should have asked him this on, on the podcast, but d- does that make him feel any differently or, you know, like you always think if I kill this big deer, is it going to make me feel different? Outlook on no, it. with him, I can a hundred million percent say he's not changing his personality. It makes sense. Point. He's old man winner. He is Mr. old Consistency. man winner. He's consistent in his approach to life. Nice. So I'm, but I guarantee you they partied. I know they did. They partied that night at the bunkhouse good. and had themselves a good time and it was well-deserved. Good. Well, if folks hang around the show for a little longer after the credits, they'll get a little sneak peek like this on uh, upcoming episodes. All right. Maybe we should just put it at the front end. Ooh. And then they can <laughs> so just they duck can hear out. out. <laughs> well, hey, the show's over. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> so. All right, now it's the real end. All right. Boom. We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DOD TV was brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. 